Great. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, so uh, this is a kind of uh, based on a joint project with Andrew Snowden, um, although I, I actually this is just a learning seminar, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sort of focus a lot on like um, the background and, and kind of motivation and, and setting stuff up um, and maybe not not get too much into the actual like details of, of our work, uh, but Andrew's coming in like a can always hear more of the uh, of that from him. Um, so okay, so roughly, uh, it is the plan. So I'm going to uh, give a uh, an overview of uh, Fresnay theory, uh, and really, it's mostly going to be sort of examples. Um, and then uh, I want to talk about. Uh, all of the morphic groups in particular, this is like kind of where where our motivation was from uh, so I think uh you know I have probably different different goals for many of you. I'm a representation theorist um so kind of. We got into this stuff um, for for our own reasons, and that I'll I'll, I'll touch on a little bit uh, in in the second part, uh, and then actually talk about what I'll call sort of linear Fresnay theory. I really, sort of get into. Um, Actually, what we kind of apply this to, uh, and the kind of the the modifications needed to make it work in that setting. All right, so that's the plan. Um, so let's uh, start off. I want to talk about kind of classical um, Brazilian theory, and really, I want to kind of do it through some uh, examples. Um, so so by the way, uh, like, feel free to ask any questions or interrupt me. I, you know, I imagine in a learning seminar, it should be very uh, interactive. So by all means, uh, stop me. Uh, so all right, so the first example I want to talk about is uh, the rational numbers as a, uh, as a totally ordered set. Um, Okay, so this is going to be an example of the Fresnay limit. Um, but what does that mean? I want to sort of demonstrate uh, through uh, a, a theorem. So, so the theorem is uh, let uh, S be a uh, Where is it? Which is uh, have two properties. So the first uh, is that it's it's dense. Uh, and what this means is that uh, for all A and B, if A is less than B, there's some C that lives in between them, right? So uh, there exists a C uh, satisfying A less than B. Less than B. All right, so it's dense. Uh, and two, it has no endpoints, uh, meaning it has no maximal or minimal elements. Oh, uh, or elements. Hmm. Definition I meant to put in the statement, but I'll just put it here instead. Uh, let's. I want to assume S is countable.
Right side of a countable totally ordered set that's dense and has no maximal or minimal elements. And the theorem is it is secretly irrational numbers all along. All right, so there's a unique countable totally ordered set with this density property and, and, and no endpoints. All right, and uh, I wanna actually just like go through the proof of this. Um, because, well, it's a learning seminar and I, I think this, this sort of argument uh, is worth seeing. Um, so, I mean, I guess the, the concept here is we need to construct a, an order preserving bijection from S uh, and Q, well, we sort of don't know anything about S except these properties, so, so let's, let's use them. Um, so the first step is to fix enumerations of uh, S and Q. All right, so right away, we use the property um, that they are, um, that they're countable. So now uh, I'm gonna kind of construct a, a bijection, but I'm really gonna think of it as a sort of uh, matching between them, right? So it's instead of kind of being one directional, I wanna think of it as kind of both directions uh, simultaneously. And, and the, the argument goes like this. So. Uh, uh, first, we're going to send uh, send S one anywhere. I and Q I for the um, the corresponding thing. So we send S one. Really anywhere in Q, we could we could send it to uh, Q one. So maybe maybe able to, let's say, you know, probably Q one is a natural choice, but uh, uh, for uniformity. Uh, so that's the first step. We just do anything, uh, and then we're gonna find the smallest i. Uh, Such that uh, QI is unmatched uh, and then we're gonna pair that up with something in S with an unmatched. Uh, as day uh, subject to the constraint. So initially the constraint will just be that SJ has to either be less than or greater than S1, depending on where Q uh, was in relation. Uh, subject to the constraints. All right, and then we do kind of the same step, uh, but we start with now the smallest match, uh, smallest unmatched SI, and we match it with something in, in the rational numbers. And we kind of go back and forth. So repeat. And we do. And three uh, for our basis. Okay, so let me kind of draw a, a schematic of what, what this argument is doing. Uh, so we have, uh, like that, we have, uh, we have Q and we have S. They're both totally ordered. 
uh, sets. And what we do is we just take something in S, send it anywhere in Q. Uh, so this is S1 is getting matched with, could be Q1. Uh, and then we look at the, the next thing in Q, the next unmatched thing, which we can do because we've enumerated them. And that lives, maybe that lives here. Uh, and then we just send it anywhere in uh, this interval. Uh, if we want to be concrete, we can just pick the least, uh, the least SI in this interval and just send it there. Uh, and then we repeat this. Now on the S side, maybe our next S is in between the two that we've already chosen. That means we have to then match it with something in between the two above. All right. And, and you can see that because of this uh, density property, we always are going to have something, right? So if we, if we know that this thing has to land between these two things, we always have yeah, infinitely many choices for that. Uh, so we can never run into to a problem. Uh, and the bouncing back and forth between kind of going from Q to S and from S to Q, we're using that to ensure that it's, it's bijective. Right, so we def we never miss anything because uh, the the if rational number gets matched at it at most step like two i. Um, all right, and same thing for the if element of s. So we just kind of back and forth construct this uh, by direction and it's and it's order preserving. All right, so that's. Uh, The proof of this fact, uh, and the second argument is is all the back and forth argument. Um, all right. So, oh, you're here. Um, but okay. So there's more. There's one. There's another property of of this photo order Q. Uh, so moreover. Uh, any finite total order so any finite total order embeds uh, in the rational numbers. All right, that hopefully is, is pretty, pretty obvious. Just, you know, if, you're, if your total order has n things, there's, well, there's only one total order on n elements. Uh, and, uh, well, this is up to a three ordering them. Um, but then you just pick any n elements in Q and just send them in order. And that, that's a, a embedding. Uh, but moreover, uh, and any two embeddings so I might have f sitting inside the rational numbers in two different ways, uh, any two embeddings differ by an automorphism of the rational numbers. Okay. So in particular, in this case, we can even take it T 
to be piecewise linear. Okay, so let me uh, kind of draw up what, what this means. Uh, so I'll draw sort of two copies of Q. Uh, and so if I have a finite total order embedded inside Q, that's just some number of points uh, sitting inside the rational numbers. And maybe I have kind of two different uh, embeddings, but the, the point is I can actually map Q onto itself in a way that will send uh, each red point to uh, the corresponding red point. And then I can kind of fill in the rest of it and then you can do it in lots of ways. So there's, you know, there's actually uh, a huge uh, collection of automorphisms of Q that do this, but in particular, you can just linearly send this interval uh, to this one, this interval, to this one, this one, to this one, this one, to this one, and one to that one. So in, in this case, uh, you, you can be very explicit about what uh, what the automorphism is. Okay, so that uh, that's going to be our, our first example of of a Frise limit and sort of the key properties of a Frise limit. Um, all right, so I want to give another uh, example. Does anyone have any questions about this, either the statement or the, the sort of arguments? If you bet, if you embed an infinite set in two different ways, can you also always relate them by an automorphism? Infinite set. I think not. Um, what I would be worried about once you have infinite sequences is I could have, um, if I have an infinite sequence that is sort of approaching a limit, a limit in Q, um, and then I take kind of the infinite sequence, the same thing, but not that uh, limit point. I think we can we can distinguish between those two uh, cases. So um, yeah, so this is very good at sort of detecting finite substructures and properties of that, but infinite ones are more complicated. Um, so yeah, you do have to uh, yeah worry about sort of limits once you once you pass to the in infinite case. All right, thank you. Other questions? Great. Um, all right, so I want to go to our second example. Um, so for this one, wait, should I, should I write on this board or can they see? All right, so the second example. Uh, is the radograph. Okay, so what is this? So this is uh, a graph, uh, and here's here's how it's constructed. So I'll, I'll give a couple of constructions. Uh, so start with. Uh, Countably many many vertices. All them um, the i uh, or i will be a natural number. So we have infinitely many vertices, and then for every pair. Uh, 
for every pair di v j uh, let's say sort of unordered pairs with i not equal to j flip a coin right and then we include the edge Uh, if it's heads and don't include if it's tails. All right, so uh, I guess I can just describe a few sort of a process for constructing uh, infinite random graph, um, but uh, the fact, the, the, not the fact that we'll, I'll, I'll sort of explain you why it's true in a minute. Uh, in fact, you always get the same thing. It seems like I just defined some sort of like, you know, probability space of, of random graphs. Um, but actually, with probability one, if you do this process, you always end up with the same thing. Uh, and that's the, the router graph. All right. So this is, in a sense, the countable infinite random graph. Uh, Okay, so that's a, uh, a sort of bizarre fact that you can you can sort of chew up. Well, I'll explain why it's true in a, in a minute. Uh, but uh, let me give a uh, non-probabilistic construction as well. Uh, and it turns out there's there's actually lots of them. there's a bunch of these in the literature. Um, so so or. Uh, Again, we'll take vertices uh, bi or i in the natural numbers uh, and we'll connect uh, edges the i to be J if, uh, well, let's, let's say I is less than J and the uh, I binary digit of J, so you write J as a binary number, you look at the, the I uh, digit of it, starting at the, the right, I guess, uh, the i binary digit of j is 1. Very different uh, construction, but, but sort of very explicit. Um, so in, in particular, like v1 is attached to all of the odd numbers. Uh, and, and v2 is attached to numbers that are, I guess, like, Two mod four or three mod four, uh, and sort of so on. Um, all right, so not at all clear that these two constructions would give you um, the same thing, and probably not clear that this fact about a random graph uh, always being always giving the same thing uh, not clear. Uh, let me give. One more for fun. Uh, I think the rest is, is a fun construction. Uh, so, or uh, we're going to take vertices uh, V sub P uh, for primes. 
T times root to one mod four. And edges BP connecting to B2 if P is a quadratic residue. Mod Q. The fact that one mod four means this is actually a symmetric relation. It's quite part of quadratic reciprocity. Great. So three very different uh, ways of getting uh, an infinite graph, and I claim they're uh, they're all the same, uh, and that's that's the Rado graph. Um, okay. Is it also true for it that then you find the support does more extends to the whole as a model? We'll get there. <laughs> uh, yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, so what? That's what? going to be the proof why they're all the same. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, all right, so what is um, the key the key property of uh, these constructions and that sort of makes this all uh, work is is the following uh, so this is this is called uh, extension property. So here's what this says. So I'm going to have uh, two sets of vertices. Let's call it U1 and U2. Uh, so U1, U2 are going to be finite subsets of vertices. All right, so given any two finite subsets of vertices, uh, we can find some new vertex x which connects to everything in u1 but doesn't connect uh, to anything in u2 so exists an x such that uh, x u uh, is an edge for U in U1 and X uh, W is not an edge for W in U2. Okay, so for any two disjoint uh, finite subsets of vertices, uh, we have this property. Okay, and I guess I will let you let you think for a minute why all three of these graphs have that property. Okay, uh, and So would it also be the same if I did like one probability one half, but one quarter seems to 
look to the same thing. Yep. Yeah. Uh, any any fixed probability uh, will work. Uh, and there are also lots of other uh, deterministic construction. Uh, yeah, these are are two pretty easy ones, but there are, are lots and lots of them. Um, but all right, the theorem is uh, any uh, any two countable graphs satisfying the extension property are smart. Okay, so well, once we prove this, that explains that all, all of those are the same. Um, so the proof is going to be exactly the same as before. So the proof is uh, we're going to use the same back and forth argument. Okay, so let me, uh, maybe I won't, um, I won't go into it as much detail, but the point is you enumerate uh, the vertex sets. On, on both graphs, and then you alternate Uh, uh, sending the least unmatched thing, uh, matching the least All right, so we can just construct a uh, an isomorphism of, of graphs this way, just kind of going back and forth. And this extension property is exactly what we need to ensure that we can always do this. So, so kind of the point being, you imagine this being the new vertex we want to. Uh, We've already matched up U1 and U2. Kind of all, all of this stuff is what's already matched. Uh, but then we just look at uh, on the side that we're defining it from, where X sort of lives to begin with, um, we look at which things it's connected to and which things it's not connected to. And that defines our U1 and U2 from the other side. And this extension property tells us there's some places to give our new, new vertex. Right, so it's sort of exactly the same uh, argument as, as that step there, where at every step there was something that kind of lived in between those two uh, vertices. Now it's a little bit more complicated because the relationship it can have is basically all possible ways of connecting with the kind of previously existing graph, um, but it's the same uh, argument. Okay? So that's that's uh, the proof. And sorry, moreover, uh, again, we have this, this property and sort of, I mean, it follows from almost the exact same, uh, or from, from this argument, really. Uh, any finite graph. Uh, G, uh, algebra has, it embeds in the Rado graph and
if I have two embeddings of the same uh, graph in, into the router graph, uh, then there's a, uh, an automorphism. There's an automorphism exchanging that. Uh, and well, the proof of this is basically uh, this, this back and forth argument. You just sort of start with, uh, with G and then construct this automorphism in exactly this, the same argument. Um, all right. So that's, uh, that's the Rado graph sort of in several different ways. Uh, and it's, I mean, it's kind of neat, I think, that uh, an infinite graph with those properties, and you can describe it in several ways. Um, all right, any questions about the router graph? Okay, so. Uh, so you've noticed there's like um, some commonalities between uh, those two cases, uh, and that's kind of exactly what the notion of of a Frisee limit is capturing. Is is kind of uh, capturing those two examples. All right, so I guess the Uh, my question is, what makes this work? All right, and that's going to be the, the content of uh, Frise's theorem, uh, what makes this work. <laughs> so, um, so, all right, I'm going to be a little uh, informal because I, I don't want to get too much into like sort of the heavy model theoretic uh, language, because this is ultimately a uh, theorem in, in model theory. Um, but here's, if, here's what, what's going on. So we have, have a class uh, C of uh, structures. Let me first, I want me to put some, some axioms here, uh, say a little bit of what I mean by, by, by structure. So our two examples, our structures are going to be either like a total order uh, or uh, a graph. Um, but sort of maybe more generally what I mean is uh, a structure is going to be a set uh, with some relations uh, and maybe operations satisfying the rules of, of some theory. Here I'm using the word theory in like a model theoretic uh, sense. What you should think of is uh, like a total order has uh, a relation on it that says whether A is less than B. And then the rules are just, you know, the normal axioms of being a, of a, of a total order, you know, transitivity, uh, anti-symmetry, whatever, all, all those. Um, all right, and a graph. We think of it as uh, the set is the vertex set, and then the relation is which set of uh, which pairs form edges and which don't. Okay, so that's um, that's what I what I mean. Um, all right, and uh, 
what do I what do I need from this to, in order to run a, a construction like the Rado graph or the um, the rational numbers? Uh, okay, so so first, just uh, maybe this should even have been in part of what I mean by a class here. So C should be uh, So C should be closed under isomorphism. So it, you know, when I, I can really think of, of things as being the same if they're isomorphic, uh, or, or at least it both in this class of structures. Uh, so C is what I'm going to call hereditary. Uh, which means that um, generated substructures um, still in C. Uh, so it's it's sort of closed under under taking substructures. Um, so in my in, in the examples uh, for a total order, if you just take a subset, uh, finitely generated just means it would be a finite subset. So a finite subset of a total order inherits a total order. Um, for graphs, um, if you the uh, substructures are the induced subgraphs, uh, so you you remember you know which things are edges and which things are non edges. Um, so. An induced subgraph of a graph, obviously, is, is still a graph. Um, and we could have some more complicated stuff. Uh, if we had kind of operations, if we wanted to uh, have a set with like an, an addition thing, we'd really want uh, to kind of close things up. So not just take a finite subset, but take a finite subset that's uh, closed under, under addition. Um, but whatever our, our sort of theory is, it should descend to finitely generated. Uh, Substructures in C. Uh, okay. So these are uh, kind of basic ones, and then the things that we need in order for a uh, for Z limit to exist, uh, we need a joint embedding property. Uh, so this just said that for all uh, X and Y, there exists some Z such that um, both X and Y include into Z. Okay, so given any two uh, uh, structures in our class, we can find a larger one that contains both of them. And then uh, the fourth one is uh, kind of a related but sort of stronger thing. And this is, this is called the amalgamation property. I want to say this is sort of the most important one uh, in some sense. I mean, like they're all they're all important and necessary to run this, um, but this is maybe the, uh, the sort of least common property that holds it, and what kind of ultimately makes it work. Uh, and the amalgamation property is um, so given if I have. Embedded in two things, right? So I have, I have two embeddings of, of, of X in my uh, class of structures. There exists uh, a W 
where uh, X embeds So there exists some W uh, that contains uh, both Y and Z sort of glued along X, amalgamated uh, along X. I guess I want to maybe say a warning here. Uh, typically, this will not be uh, unique. So. Uh, it's sort of very tempting to like think of this as some sort of like push out diagram or something, uh, but that's not what we need. Uh, we just need that there uh, is some way of extending it. Uh, so let me maybe say uh, kind of what, what this looks like in an example. Uh, all right. Um, so let me look at the uh, example of total orders. Um, so So let me, I'm going to draw uh, two total orders. Uh, here are two, order, two total orders. Uh, and I want to, I, I sort of, through them in these colors, uh, to me, I'm going to, I want to sort of amalgamate uh, along the green ones, right? So I have, uh, so this is maybe Y, this is Z, and this is, uh, X is these two dots. Um, and you'll notice that there are actually like, a, a number of ways we could do this. Um, so let me. And Z, it looks like they're all green. Yeah. Oh, it looks like they're all green. This is blue. Maybe I should. Is blue bad? <laughs> it's hard to tell them apart. Okay. Is that better? Great. Uh, okay. So, so W can be. A few different things. So the important thing is uh, we have these two uh, vertices uh, x that are going to be sort of fixed. And so, okay, one way I could do this is like this. Right, so you can, if we ignore uh, the orange, uh, the orange points, this is just a copy of, of Y. And if we ignore the white points, it's a copy of, of Z. Um, but that's not the only way we could do it, right? I could, uh, we don't have sort of any information about where the orange and, and white points live relative to each other. So I could have also had them kind of flipped around. But that's not all. We can also potentially have collisions and and even if we know that X and Y both embed in W, we don't necessarily know that they embed sort of in, in, a, in a disjoint way. So there's also things that look like uh, maybe 
maybe I have a point and then I have this is going to be but these two points are, are supposed to be both white and orange. I'm sure it's terrible to see on a on a chalkboard. Um, but I guess the point is uh, this counts. Right? This is this is an amalgamation. Um, so we have, and there's a lot, there's there's more ways even, even for this simple example. All right. Um, so that's the uh, the caveat on amalgamation. Um, but what we just need to assume is that they always uh, exist. You know, potentially there can be lots of them. Uh, and I would say sort of typically uh, there are lots of them. What among X, Y, and Z needs to be finite here? Why do X, Y, and Z need to be finite? Well, which of them need to be finite for this property? I mean, as I wrote it, just this property still makes sense for uh, for infinite uh, for infinite objects. Um, we're only gonna kind of assume it for finite things. I haven't I stated the the theorem yet, um, but what we yeah what we really want to think of this class as being like the class of, of sort of finite structures, whether that means literally finite sets with with some structure or maybe finitely generated uh, things. Um, but yeah, that's the we're we're going to assume they're finite, and for for what is about to come. Okay. All right, so let me make sure I state this right. Um, yeah, I'm, as I said, I'm not actually a, a model theorist. So uh, this, all of this stuff was, uh, was new to me, uh, you know, six months ago, maybe more like a year ago. Um, so theorem, uh, Rosé's theorem uh, is given, uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll just state the, the sort of simplest version, which will be for finite things, given a class uh, C of uh, finite objects, uh, finite structures, satisfying uh, properties one through four. Uh, uh, okay, let me, so there exists uh, a unique countable Structure. I guess okay. I don't want to assume everything is finite, but I want to assume those properties for finite uh, substructures because um, I want this to be this countable one to live inside C. I need countable structure uh, such that uh, exactly these properties hold. So every uh, one. Every finite uh, structure finite X in our C uh, embeds. I mean, I guess I'll call it a kind of a finite structure F for Prince and two. Uh, so I call so this this first property we'll call universality, meaning it, it contains all the finite structures. Uh, the second property is homogeneity, 
uh, is that uh, any two embeddings differ by an automorphism. Right, so any two embeddings of, again, of a finite substructure uh, will differ by an automorphism. Okay. And so uh, these are like exactly the properties of the radograph and the, the rational numbers. Uh, for Zay's theorem is sort of a characterization of what sorts of theories admit those, uh, that those type of limits uh, and sort of this, this amalgamation property is kind of the key thing that you need. I'm not going to prove this theorem. Um, it's, this is somewhat more involved, um, but I think we should take a break and then I'll go on to more modern stuff. Once again, you only require this for finite. <laughs> yeah, for finite. Yeah. You can ask it for anything, I guess we want. We want it for finite. So groups don't have the amalgamation. So groups, yeah, I guess it's what class of, of yeah, they, they, they typically don't have the amalgamation property. Um, but you do have like the amalgamated free product of groups. It's like, sure, but, it, but it, it won't, won't uh, be an embedding. It won't be an embedding, yeah. Um, so you have, yeah, things, things kind of can be forced to collapse. Should I continue? All right. So that was all sort of the classical uh, story. Um, I do want to talk a little bit about, um, I want to talk about oligomorphic groups. Uh, and sort of our, our context. Um, so an oligomorphic group, I'll, I'll, I'll just sort of say, and thing is, if these automorphism groups of these Frise limits are examples of uh, oligomorphic groups. So that, that'll be sort of what that class of groups means. Um, but I want to say a little bit about how this sort of arose for us, because again, I am I'm not a, uh, a model theorist or, or a logician or representation theorist. Um, and this, this condition church just showed up in something we were trying to do. Um, so let me briefly describe that context. Uh, so Deleem uh, defined these categories uh, So it's rep st, uh, and I'm gonna think of it as, as t being a, a complex number, uh, and these sort of interpolate categories of representations of symmetric groups.
it's a night right we're going to to mean like complex representations of the symmetric group SN. Uh, and kind of bizarrely, Delene showed that there exists uh, this sort of family of categories varying in a, in a parameter uh, T and uh, interpolate these um, in, in, a, in a sense. Um, so it's kind of a, a bizarre uh, instruction, um, but they, they've been sort of an objects of interest in kind of trying to um, understand them and, and generalize them uh, is something that I and, and other people uh, work on a lot. Um, and kind of the, the place that's Third for us is uh, so typically the like previously known kind of constructions of these really go kind of via this property of that um, you have this sequence of, of finite groups and you end up kind of constructing something that uh, interpolates it. So our uh, our sort of initial goal was we wanted to. Uh, we wanted to construct these uh, these categories FST from S infinity, uh, not not the finite groups, right? So we we sort of thought that like this family of, of categories should be attached to the infinite symmetric group in some sort of canonical way. Uh, and not necessarily like uh, coming from this uh, this finite uh, finite group. Sorry. Um, and so the uh, you know long story short is like we succeeded. Uh, uh, we did it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and I mean, so this is a long. This is a long paper. We do all this this um, uh, theory of um, uh, essentially like integration on um, oligomorphic groups um, in order to do it. Uh, it's not the paper that I'm that I want to actually talk about. Um, but the kind of the key uh, property that we needed to even get started. Was was kind of the following. Um, so if I have S infinity acting on uh, the natural numbers and kind of in 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 the natural way, and if you're if you're wondering what I mean by S infinity, doesn't matter. Whatever you want it to mean. Uh, so the, the key property. That ended up even, you know, to even take one step in the direction of this it is the following. So S infinity acts on, on the natural numbers. Uh, so this is, you know, transitively. Uh, but moreover, it sort of it gets induced action, and it's not just on natural numbers, but on like K tuples of natural numbers. Uh, and it's no longer transitive because you know you could have collisions. You could have uh, you know your k tuple could consist of all the same number, or it could consist of k different numbers, and that, those are different situations. Um, so it's not transitive, but as finitely many words. Okay, and this is a little unusual. So it has finitely many orbits for all k. So right, if you have a finite group acting on a finite set, sure, you're going to have finitely many orbits on k powers of that set uh, always. But for infinite groups, this is weird. Like uh, most of the time, if you have an infinite group acting on an infinite set, even if that action is transitive, typically as soon as you go to 
ordered pairs, there'll be infinitely many uh, orbits. Um, so this, this property uh, like showed up immediately for us in trying to make this work because this ensured that certain uh, bases in these categories we're trying to define uh, would be finite dimension. Um, and it turns out this is basically exactly the definition of an open morphing group. Uh, so G and so G acting on X oligomorphically means means X and K has finally many, many orbits. Or okay. Um, all right. And the sort of key examples of this are we have, say, S infinity acting on, on the natural numbers. I already said that one. Uh, I could have. Uh, Geo infinity FQ acting on uh, Q to the infinity, not F infinity to the Q. Um, I can have, have those. Uh, I can have the automorphisms of the rational numbers and it's already acting on just the key itself. Yeah, maybe. I have to think about anyway. Uh, yeah, I know that sounds sounds reasonable. Um, yeah, okay, so we have uh, these examples, and what I what I want to sort of highlight in, in these ones is uh, so in this one, for example, if we look at uh, orbits on instead of taking maybe k tuples of vertices, we can look at k element subsets of vertices. Uh, the orbits are exactly graphs on k elements. Uh, similarly here, uh, the orbits, total orders on, on, on a set of size n. Um, so just the different ways of ordering them. So right, if I look at k tuples of elements in Q, use their relative order tells you the orbit. Under, under this group. All right, so uh, so this is where, this is how we got sort of interested in this, uh, is we realized that this uh, is Deline categories, while sort of the previously known examples, uh, like this rep ST, there's also a rep GLT of Q that people have constructed, are coming from these groups that are sort of like a union of their finite groups. Um, these ones aren't like that. So automorphisms of Q with its order has no finite subgroups. Uh, there, so it's not like a union of finite groups the same way that maybe the smallest version of S infinity is. Um, and yet it turns out we were able to sort of run our, our construction on this. So this, this sort of, uh, so that there's, there's basically way more of these, uh, these sort of interesting answer categories uh, than were previously thought. And Deline's construction was in some sense the only known uh, construction of, of categories of this type. Uh, and we realized that there, there's actually a bunch more coming from uh, these oligomorphic groups. So that was our, uh, our previous project that I won't go too much into more, uh, but 
I want to mention it uh, because so we were able to to you know construct this Deline category rep st, uh, but Deline also defined. Uh, Is interpolated categories um, of representations uh, for general linear and orthogonal numbers. Uh, and so while, while this sort of worked for these like infinite discrete groups, um, it, it didn't work over here. And so we started wondering like, is there a sort of linear oligomorphic version that works for these. So our, our question was, uh, is there a, uh, a construction These, uh, which then sort of led us to these questions of, okay, well, wait, what is what does like Brise theory mean and look like uh, for sort of linear groups? Uh, and then we kind of stumbled onto this like nice picture uh, that I will sort of very briefly summarize. Uh, so in this yeah. setting, you have fixed some ground fields, which now is no longer necessarily. Yeah. So. Um, well, so in order for Deline's construction to be kind of well behaved, uh, you you really want it to be over uh, like just zero algebraically close. Um, you can relax either of those conditions and get something, um, but uh, it's more more poorly behaved. Um, Sorry, so do these also interpolate uh, something? I, I'm not sure what you mean by interpolate. But... Yeah, so I'm, I'm being deliberately vague about what I mean by interpolate, but yes, these, these interpolate representations of like the general linear groups and the orthogonal groups. So general linear group of what? Of, the, of this field. So I'm thinking of, yeah, if I, if I don't write a thing, I think of these as algebraic groups and I say think yeah, algebraic As n increases? Yes. Yeah, you're sort of parameterizing the like dimension. Uh, yeah, so these these we should take as algebraic representations of the algebraic groups. Uh, and that's that's the category that I mean. So there's not actually groups ST and GLT and OT, but are there other algebraic uh, things that act on these? I mean, so I, I guess somehow um, what you should think, I mean, these are like as close being representations of a group as, as you can get. Um, so maybe there's there's this this theory of, of Tanakian formalism, uh, which tells you basically if you have a uh, a category with enough extra structure, uh, and then that's kind of a, a long list, uh, and you have a, a map from that category to vector spaces, a like uh, call it a fiber funker. Uh, then you can actually realize that category and the fiber functor as representations of a group where the fiber functor is just the forgetful map to vector spaces. Um, so there's a, it's in, in a sense, this is a like complete categorical uh, classification of categories coming from representations of groups and the additional structures that they have. Um, and these categories that Deline defined are, are what we call pre tanakian they satisfy all the same internal structure, but they don't necessarily admit a fiber functor to vector spaces. So it's somehow that last, like being able to actually realize it as vector spaces with maps between them uh, is, is the only thing that they that they fail. And so, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, really, I really think of these as being kind of having all of the structure of categories and representations of groups, just, just they're not, 
Um, yeah. So let me uh, very briefly state what uh, what it is uh, Andrew and I kind of looked at. Um, so okay. So the first thing uh, is. I'm going to let Lambda be a sequence of partitions. And Lambda space is a vector space. V with uh, linear forms uh, omega i going from corresponding sure functor applied to V to our, our ground field. All right. Um, and I'll, maybe I should specify k is going to be characteristic zero. Well, at least for our meaning. So uh, let me for a second. So we have lambda is just a single partition, let's say uh, two, then uh, this is just a, a vector space. With a symmetric floor, symmetric bilinear. Form. All right, so that's kind of maybe the type of example I have in mind. Another one is I could take lambda again, just to be uh, a single partition one one, uh, and now. It's the same thing, but it's skew symmetric. Okay, so that uh, I'll give maybe a, a slightly more complicated example. Uh, if I take my list of partitions to be uh, the partition two twice, that means we have a vector space. With two uh, symmetric bilinear forms. And, and no relation between them necessarily. Um, okay, so that's uh, our notion of a, a lambda space. So it's sort of you know, meant to capture things like. Uh, yeah, multilinear forms on B satisfying uh, your, you know, satisfying certain sort of symmetry properties. So you should think of it. Um, and uh, the theorem. Uh, is basically that we can run a version of, of Brise theory here. Uh, and you, you have to sort of modify uh, the tools. Uh, but this unique, vulnerable, dimensional. Uh, Lambda space the Lambda such that uh, one every uh, finite dimensional Lambda space uh, X and 
embeds in the lambda n2, n2 such embeddings differ by an automorphism. Okay, so let me let me say a little bit about um, kind of the, the content here and, and why this is maybe interesting or surprising. Um, so if we do this over a finite field, so if we're not in if we're not in characteristic zero, we can still make sense of all this. Probably instead of uh, fixing this comment for data, you can just fix a, a sure functor. Um, a lot of the, this then just falls into the realm of like ordinary for data. Have, things are are finite, uh, and we can we can run that. So, uh, yeah. For for example, you can you can use Frise theory to get a sort of universal homogeneous vector space over F Q or a vector space equipped with a symmetric bilinear form. All that's in the ordinary realm. Um, what makes this a little weird and, and interesting is uh, if we're over an infinite field, and especially if we're over, uh, you know, the complex numbers, uh, there are moduli of lambda structures on a space. Um, so, I guess for, for these two, it's not not very interesting. There aren't that many different isomorphism classes of uh, symmetric bilinear forms. Uh, but as soon as we look at, say, a pair of bilinear forms, they can be. In, in sort of relative position to each other in a, in a lot of different ways, in sort of continuous family, uh, many ways. Uh, and then as similarly, if we look at, you know, symmetric trilinear forms, there are, uh, you know, continuously varying families of these things. Um, so there are, you know, there are typically, uh, you know, uncountably many lambda structures uh, on a on a given dimensional space, uh, and yet we can kind of embed them all in this this big thing and in a highly homogeneous way. So these these groups are now uh, they're sort of like infinite dimensional linear algebraic groups um, that are acting kind of with some high transitivity uh, properties, and they're not just like O infinity or geo infinity, the ones that we sort of have seen before that are, are just unions of their finite versions. Um, so this is sort of giving us new, weird, uh, infinite dimensional algebraic groups as part of the construction. Um, but all right, yeah, Andrew will talk more about this next week. So that's it. Thanks. Further questions? Is, um, is Francis' uh, theory and, and his theorem like, like inspiration and motivation behind this uh, rather than actually use? Yeah, so, um, well, we, we used a, uh, we, well, we sort of found alluded to and then had to fill in some details uh, a version of Frise's theorem that's a little bit more categorical. So instead of being, uh, based on on sort of sets and, and model theory it's when you can talk about you have some sort of category in our case a category of uh lambda spaces uh and then what you want is uh sort of properties on that on that category so there's an end object with this uh with with these kind of universality and homogeneity statements um so uh Parts of that are coming from this sort of uh, uh, like the categorical version of Frise theory that is not due to us. It's sort of has seems to be existed, although we couldn't find a like totally coherent reference for it. We had to write an appendix, um, but seems to be known. Uh, and then actually checking that, that that stuff works, then you have to get into the actual uh, structure of lambda spaces and polynomial functors and like getting getting the right. Uh, you know, get it satisfying the conditions that we need, then there's actually there, there's stuff to check. 
Um, but yeah, the, the for Zay theory, we didn't use the sort of classical version, but we did use a sort of pre existing, pre existing ish categorical framework. Uh, is there is there a construction for the universal space? Yeah, like, so no, not in general. So we have um, we in some very explicit examples. It's it's pretty easy. So uh, for the symmetric bilinear forms, let's say we're over algebraic closed field to make it extra easy. Um, so over algebraic closed field, uh, finite dimensional symmetric bilinear forms are pretty easy to classify there, you know, everything is non-degenerate on some subspace and then uh, there's a, a radical of it. Uh, they, the, this one is just a totally non-degenerate, uh, you know, the infinite dimensional non-degenerate uh, symmetric bilinear form. So that's, that's very concrete. Um, and I think that's maybe how you should sort of think of it is it's like you have kind of typically more and more uh, non-degeneracy type criteria that's sort of hidden in, in these lambda structures. So you, you can imagine, uh, you know, for a bilinear form, non-degenerate means when you plug in any vector, the, the linear form you get is not zero. Uh, but now once you have sort of higher degree things, there's more things you can do. You can, you can specialize, you know, if I'm in a degree three linear form, I can specialize one of the variables and get something of, of degree two, and you want that to be non-degenerate. So you have you've kind of all these things. Um, and so we sort of, I, what, we, what we sort of think is this is like a, a totally non-degenerate thing uh, will automatic, will be this. Uh, and so one way to explicitly construct it is to just like take all of your sort of defining uh, coefficients to be like algebraically independent. Uh, and that would probably do it. I think that's maybe not the most interesting example. I uh, we, we sort of suspect this to be a very generic thing. So like, probably if you write something down and it's not too special, uh, it should be it should be this unique thing. Uh, but I, exactly detecting that is, is sort of tricky. Uh, so you don't so you don't know like that if you take a generic uh, form, then it will. No, yeah, it will. It will in this in this sense, a generic one. If I take all of my coefficients of my form to be linearly independent, or algebraically independent, uh, you know, complex numbers, that will work. Um, I think that's maybe not not the most interesting example. Like we we think there should be much simpler ones, and pro probably any any random one you take would work, but showing any individual one is, yeah, we don't. We don't have an like an, ex an actual explicit example other than in very simple cases. Let's just thank you. Thanks.